Hello, and welcome to Young at Harp. Uh, I'm Deborah Henson Conant, and I'm here with Kathleen Wiley. I'm a composer performer, and Kathleen is a Jungian analyst, and we are both harp players. And we've been exploring the seven strings of passion that are at the heart of a book and a, a concert and a class that I have that take us from the impulse of creative expression all the way through to the moment of liftoff when we are actually creatively expressing. We've gone through all seven strings individually and we've also looked at the integration of those and today we want to look at something specific which is why are we doing that? Where does mm -hmm. Jungian analysis and the way that I teach or look at music what are we trying to do with that? What are the what are the things that are the same about them and and then looking at the questions of authenticity and wholeness, mm -hmm. which both of these things are trying to do, and what do those actually mean? So Kathleen, you were the one who suggested that we talk about authenticity mm -hmm. and wholeness. So can you explain what made you think of that? Yeah, you know, when we were talking about um, partly what even inspired us to want to have these conversations together and what it is that when people come to me for Jungian analysis or they come to you in your Hip Hop Academy or individual lessons, what is it they're wanting? And I think what we all want more than anything is to be able to live more authentically and more wholly. And, you know, in Jungian psychology, Jung had a concept he called individuation. And he said individuation is this organic process through which we embody and live more truly who we are as a psyche soul. So that to individuate is to really live the truth of your soul versus as we've talked before, living the truth of who you've learned you should be or who you think you should be as the good girl or the church lady or the extravagant musician or whomever. Right. <laughs> and all of those things could possibly be a part of who you authentically are. But often people adopt personas, roles in a negative way that really disconnect them from their heart and soul, from what is their own natural expression. So I think when we think about the strings of passion we've been talking about and why, what's kind of like, what's the, where are we, where, what direction are we moving in? I don't want to say what's the goal because I think it's more of a process and a journey, but I think what we're really all moving towards is to be more authentic and to be more authentic means we're more whole, that we give room and expression to um, more impulses that are within us and more of our own roles that we want to play with and the characters that live inside of us. <laughs> it's making me think of two things. One is a quote about Miles Davis and one thing is that was what my mother said to me. And uh, what the quote from that Miles Davis, I, I won't say it perfectly, is something like, man, it takes a long time to sound like yourself. Yes, 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 absolutely. <laughs> And then what made me think of my mother is that when I was a kid and I was asking her about what's right and wrong and we started talking about truth and I remember her one day saying to me, well, there's the truth, there's the whole truth, and there's nothing but the truth. And there's a reason that those three are put together because you can still lie while not telling anything that's untrue by withholding. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think that it is so beautiful that you brought out the two ideas of authenticity mm -hmm. and wholeness. Mm -hmm. And I know for sure that um, so often it seems like authenticity to me is, is, um, is breaking down, is the deconstruction of all the things that we think we are mm -hmm. so that we can get to the heart and the distillation of who we are. And then the wholeness is sort of the blooming of that seed. Mm -hmm. And I know for sure that the blooming of that seed does not happen in complete and utter, you know, perfection <laughs> and authenticity. That, that we, it, what, you know, what Miles Davis said is, you know, it, it takes a long time. I don't know exactly if he said find, but to find out, to actually try all these different things. And that's why I think one of the strings is um, when I talk about practice, mm -hmm. um, the string of practice. And one of the things I often say is you have to be bad to be good. Mm -hmm. You cannot get 
to connected or authentic or whole without going, I can't, without going through all kinds of misconceptions and missteps and everything like that. Yes. So how does that play out in the Jungian idea? And then I can talk about, or we can both talk about how that plays out in music or, or art, I mean, I'm assuming all art, but how it plays out in music in becoming authentically the musician who you are, which I might add from what I'm hearing other people say to me about my playing um, is who I am authentically is not always the me that I think is the most impressive or the one I want to show. The authentic me is sometimes and possibly always someone who is very easy to be mm-hmm. and sometimes feels like I'm not doing anything. So how could this possibly be valuable? Yeah, you, what you just said there is a profound statement because when we really live from the truth of who we are, it's easy. It's effortless. <laughs> and it can feel like, oh, the, um, we're doing nothing at all. I, I, but the truth is we've done a lot to get there. Um, I can't remember when one of my mentor analysts said, when I was getting ready to do a presentation and I was saying- Watch, about, watch out about those papers. Oh, right? yeah, thank you. I, and I said, you know, I feel guilty that I'm getting paid this much money to do this because it feels so easy. She said, yes, but you have to remember how much work <laughs> and money in your own analysis it took for you to get to this place that it, quote, feels easy. You know? Yeah, and I would think, and I, I'm thinking now that, it, and uh, so that still kind of implies that you've earned it rather than, because it seems like if we had the understanding, we could go there immediately to simply be ourselves. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I think some artists are able to, <clears throat> able to do that. <clears throat> Right. And as some artists or human beings, it may take a lifetime. Like I think, you know, it's taking me a lifetime. So, the, um, and, and I'm not saying that against what your what your um, mentor said. Um, I'm just thinking that we don't always have to think like, "Wow, I've worked so hard to get here." <laughs> well, it's like that work is opening up, right? Well, and but what I, I'll say two things to that. I think once you get there, it doesn't feel like work at all. Mm-hmm. And the second thing is, I think that um, what she meant in that case by work is that in the process of socialization, we all learn to be certain ways that block the flow of our own energy. And it is possible that there can be spontaneous kinds of quote, miraculous, unquote, transformations. I wish for that, yes, please. (laughs) Where people flip to the other side of that. But more often than not, it means really having to compassionately take oneself in hand and find the seed that is one's true nature and then be willing to walk it out of the learned shoulds, must, and ought tos. So, It is work in that it requires conscious intention and it requires focus and it requires a practice. If we go back to the string of practice, that um, it, it, it's great to say it will happen spontaneously and it just is. But the truth is, I don't know that I've ever seen anyone (laughs) where that happened. (laughs) And um, Well, they may be off on a mountain in Nepal. They might be off on the mountain. And, and, you know, and if you're there, please join us for the next dialogue. Because I think that more often than not, it is, you know, let me say this. What Jung says that consciousness is contra neutorum, that to become conscious goes against nature. That that nature, <laughs> that our nature is to just be unconscious to go on automatic pilot and let's just use this for an example to just say whatever we think not filter not censor not relate to that part of this that's wanting to rage inside so we just let it fly that's that's being unconscious it's being on automatic pilot and it goes against that to say Oh, look at that. I'm really wanting to read him a new one. (laughs) What's that about? Now, is that really what I want? Or, you know, I mean, that takes, quote, work or effort 
are really what it takes if we want to take it out of that that language is it just takes conscious presence with oneself takes that's conscious. very interesting I, i'm gonna think about so in um in playing music it's reminding me of roles of leadership and fellowship mm -hmm. um because um um and how much easier it is to just react uh. in, instead of actually responding. And sometimes we can use that for learning. For example, when I started understanding that, that telling, talking to my students <clears throat> and telling them and explaining things to them, it, it wasn't always working. And um, sometimes it was much easier for them if I would just play something and then they played it back. I played it and they played it back. Whether they played it perfectly, you know, it wasn't about the, um, the being, of, being perfect to, to the model in any, in any way, but it was about using that um, maybe impulse of reaction mm -hmm. to actually help them get moving in a way that mm -hmm. would then um, help them to um, be able to be more creative and improvisatory. So this was on the, on the road to improvisation. So that's really interesting that um, what I'm hearing is that we are just, if we could just sit around and just react, like I'm thinking about a sea an enemy, like no, somebody just touched me and I'm going in. Oh, now the sea is here, I'm going out. And like, that's basically it. Yeah. Then that is, that is very simple and you know, part of the glory and opportunity of being human is that we do have the opportunity for more. Yeah. And it sounds like that more can come through uh, looking at reaction and starting to open it up into response. Yes, I mean, you're making, I think, an important distinction is that reaction is something that just happens automatically. And we don't have a presence of self to be with that and look at all the other possibilities. But when we can respond, when we can keep ourselves in relationship to the impulse to react, and then decide how do we want to respond to the impulse, what are the myriad possibilities of how we respond to the impulse? Then we begin to be able to bring more of ourselves in the moment. Wow. So I'm going back, I'm going back to the strings um, because yeah. this, is, this is how I think about. So, and just to, to reiterate for people, the strings of passion and they should be written, you know, either in the, um, in the definition or then the description in YouTube or on the page where you're seeing this, but their impulse is the first the second is the string of um, structure. So mm -hmm. that gives the impulse something to live on, like an internal structure of our skeleton. The third is character. That's how something comes alive and differentiates. The fourth is the string of roles, which helps us um, start breaking that down and actually integrate with other people, do creative things with other people. The fifth string is the string of practice, which I would think is maybe um, an integration with the thing we're working with, in this case, the harp, through time. So that brings in the concept of time, of practice, and also allowing ourselves to be changed through that. That's the fifth. The sixth is deconstruction, which is where we break things down, which is what we're doing, so yeah. that they can become a seed of many, many, many different kinds of creative expression. And then finally is the moment of liftoff, where we reconnect or we, we, we take that through line to the initial impulse and we actually express as we are right now without trying to be anything different. So going back to this idea of impulse that you just talked about, um, it, when we react to something, it's an impulse. And I just realized that whole somehow maintaining connection to the original impulse or the chosen impulse. So for example, if you're with somebody you you want to have a relationship with them you want to be intimate with them that's your deepest impulse and now you're angry that's a different impulse that's a kind of reactive impulse how do you get back and reconnect with that original impulse and this happens in creativity all the time you have an idea to create something it's moving and life gets in the way so we're really talking about how to get back to that original impulse without all the others. 
what would you say about that? Well, and I would say in the example you gave and use the anger in service of the desire for connection instead of acting the anger out to destroy the connection. Because anger is an emotion who's saying we need to do something different. The problem is we tend to get angry and automatically think they need to do something different. And then we, we, go into ang we go into rage and bitterness and resentment and controlling behaviors and all those things that do not serve connection. But if we say, wow, I'm really angry when my partner does that, huh, what do I need to do differently? All right, well, maybe what I need to do is just accept this is part of the way they move in the world and I need to find a way to move around it. Maybe what I need to do is just back off and let him be in the kitchen by himself when he's there. <laughs> if it's a kitchen issue, you know, um, but we look at the anger and say, what's it telling me? But we look at it. What's it telling me I need to do in service of my desire to stay connected to this person? Wow. Okay. So what do I need to do in service of this true impulse, whatever that true impulse is? So what, what is an, a Jungian, what is a Jungian? So, so let me, um, I'm just going to bring out a musical idea that <laughs> will help in that. And then I want to, I'd love to have you bring out a Jungian idea. So in, in, in music or in creativity or in creating things that I'm, I'm always creating things that are words and music or words, music, mm -hmm. and story the things that help me reconnect to the original impulse are um, uh, visualizations when I can make a drawing for myself or a map, often something far simpler than I think it should be. Mm -hmm. And when, so that's the first thing to make myself some kind of image of what it is I want to do. Okay. And then that's a, a structure. I could add character to it if I was, if I wanted to decorate it or expand it, but I would go directly to a practice and the practice being don't just make it, but revisit it, revisit it, revisit it, revisit it and open up that relationship. If I, if I'm, um, and that's what I did. For example, I was, I started to write a musical many, many years ago, really loved it. And then it fell by the wayside as life took off. And finally I discovered the solution uh to bringing it back to life and that was simply to hire somebody to sit with me for three hours a week at a certain time where we revisited and it wasn't just anybody to sit with me it was a it was a, a musician who was able to play what i had written there what however crazy it was mm -hmm. but um but i can see that i followed that pattern i took what i had even though it seemed like a complete mess mm -hmm. i put it in a form that i could hand to him with all my embarrassment and shame and then he played through it and then we added practice we did this every week and if when i could i would go back and do some updating during the week but when i couldn't we just played through it again mm -hmm. but that revisiting 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 was always there and i would call that a practice mm -hmm. so i took the impulse that had gotten um um just dis, dis, it's not destructive dis, corroded basically mm -hmm. through time i created some structure out of it whatever however embarrassing and then i applied the principle of practice to it right. so so um how would you do that how would jung look at that you've got an impulse you love somebody or you love something it's 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 in danger of getting corroded or disappearing well, I think you have to really stay in relationship to the energy or the, what you're calling the impulse. So in this case, the desire for love, which we all have, that if we can stay in relationship to the de desire for love, and chances are in order to do that, if we're scared, we're going to have to be willing to also be in relationship to all of the experiences we've had where we did want to be loved and we were open to it, but we got something different. We oh. got what felt like a rejection. We got what felt like criticism. We got shamed for it. And that we have to be able thus to keep our desire in spite of those experiences. And that's part of the work of analysis is how do we um, revisit or be willing to be with those, those, 
old emotional states that get triggered from historical events so that they can integrate, so that they can organically become connected to our conscious self, where then we're more whole and their energy isn't split off to sidetrack us. Okay, so give, give me a how. So when you said how to be with them, what does that look like? What does that mean? And I, what, I'm, what I'm thinking we're talking about is, now we're talking about how to create wholeness, how to connect with wholeness. Yeah, right? and again, it's, I, I say it repeatedly, it's a simple thing of being willing to be in relationship with. And what does that mean? Yeah. So, like, so if, I'm, if I say, I'm willing to be in relationship, I, I know that is, I mean, is it as simple as like, write out 100 times, I'm willing to be in, I know it's not, <laughs> I am willing to be in relationship, but, but uh, what are, like, what are the steps to, to being in relationship? Well, yeah, like I know I was, I, or even just like feeling something, and I know that sounds really crazy, but um, like, like I know that one of the steps to being able to feel something is n don't uh, cover it up. Like if I know that my cover up is food or is watching, binge watching on Netflix or something, the impulse is to go do the, oh, I'll have a frozen fudge bar now, you know, but not, not doing that so that I actually remove the distractions. Um, I mean, but that's taken a long time to even identify that those are the things I'm doing to hide for myself. Well, that, that is one of the things we have to be willing to do. I, I think, you know, ultimately what we have to do is remove anything that prevents us from being in our body and experiencing whatever body sensations, emotions, and images arise in the moment. So, that sounds like meditation. Well, meditation, mindfulness is, I, I think if I were going to try to give you a shorthand way of getting at it, I do think meditation practices, some of them, I think mindfulness practices definitely um, help you get there. You know, there, uh, Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen's somatic, um, somatic experiencing, I don't think I'm saying that quite right. I mean, there, there are a variety of practices. From a Jungian point of view, on your own, sitting and doing stream of consciousness journaling, where you're not letting your ego lead, but you're just, I always tell people, it's whatever that little monkey mind, that chatterbox in the back of your brain is saying, you just write it down without filtering it. it you, you just don't censor it, you don't filter it, you just go with it. Because that allows you to begin to drop down into what is going on at the body level. And so, Ultimately, to be in relationship with means, first of all, we have to be able to stay present to our own experience, which means not numbing or covering up what we're experiencing in body sensation, again, what emotion is coming up, and what images, because often emotions are accompanied by images or memories. No. I'm, I'm, I'm totally taken by what you talked about, like the drivel, the drivel, drivel writing in a sense. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, I, and I was realizing that that's something that people don't do. And I don't tell my students to do it, but I think I will start telling them and telling me too. We can do that with an instrument as well. Oh, yes. We, uh, we never do. I mean, I don't even know. This isn't, this isn't on. I can turn it on, actually. Um, um, but, but, but let's, it doesn't even matter because it, we don't have to hear me do it. Um, you know, usually when we go to approach an instrument, like when I go to practice in the morning, I have a set of practices, mm -hmm. but what if I didn't do that first? Right. What if I put a timer on and I just, even, you know, even without touching it, maybe to explore, literally explore the instrument in new ways and give myself the time to touch mm -hmm. it, to play with it, to find out where, where are all the sounds? What are all the different things that it might do? Um, I don't know what that would do. I mean, it would be a really interesting experiment to try, you know, even for a week to spend I mean, it's, it's hard for me to imagine even spending three minutes doing that. I'm thinking, uh -huh. I would be so bored. I would immediately want to do something. And yet, what, and yet, 
I don't know what would come out of that. And I think for me right now, one of the big things, the big question that's on my mind is how do I, uh, how do I expand my vision from within the vision that I have? Uh -huh. And um, so if, and, and, and I, the big revelation I came to this morning was like, well, be happy, try being happy about everything. You know, that's, that's just for fun, just to open it up. You know, what, what does that open up? That's a new way of being. So I'm thinking um, another way of expanding my ability to vision outside of the vision that I already have mm -hmm. could be what, it, it just seems horrible to put on a timer and spend 10 minutes like blah, 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 blah. Why does it seem horrible to me? Because somewhere you're dismissing the value of whatever's going on inside of you that might still not have a structure you understand. Right. Oh, so and, I'm immediately wanting to go to structure. Right. Instead of giving yourself time to be with the energies that are present. Right. So I have to be like, oh, wow. If I was going through evolution. Right. Um, you know, I have to like, no, don't crawl out of the water now. Just, just don't, and don't, don't even, no, just stay one cell. Just, just for now. Let's just be one cell and just see what that one cellness is, right? Yeah. And you know, sometimes, and, and I have had a tendency to this and have worked on it over the decades in my own analysis, uh -huh. that um, because of some childhood things, I learned that if I had an impulse or desire, I formed it up really quick. And it was a defense mechanism out of a deep fear that if I didn't form it up quick, I wouldn't get it. I wouldn't have it. And over the years, I really learned how that would short circuit other parts of me. Can you give me an example of what, what that might look like? Oh, oh gosh, probably not. Okay. <laughs> we'll see if one comes up. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I'll think I'll have to think about that. I mean, I think it could be as simple as like, um, you know, wanting to take a trip that I just impulsively booked without really thinking through, is this the best time? Is this the real place I want to go? But it's like I get offered the trip and it was like, oh my God, it was an expansion. If I didn't do it, I wouldn't get to do it. Something in me would shut me down. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. So a lack, also not having the trust that like, if this is, you know, this is going to happen or, and it's not, yeah, like, I don't have to like jump on it. Right, that I don't have to jump on it, that I could take some time to explore it and see if this is what I really want. But I want to circle back, um, Deborah, to what you were saying about going to the heart as a way of kind of stream of consciousness playing versus writing with words. Um, you know, I've been dealing with my sick little dog who had to pass last week. And um, the day before, I was in such turmoil about what to do. And so I sat down at my harp and thought, I'm just going to close my eyes and see what resonates for me. Mm. And it was such an interesting experience because I played around with, um, consciously played around a little bit with moving between some, some chord progression. Um, so I started out and I found that the G two octaves below middle C was so comforting to me that just hearing that one string pluck wow. just somehow helped something in me let go. And I played with that in a meditation and then I turned around and a little later and I did another, another meditation and I had my harp in the key of G. So I had, I had the F sharp. So for anyone who's kind of watching this, I'm, uh, let me just turn this harp on. Yeah. Let me put her yeah. it's, it's really interesting that this instrument doesn't have sound <laughs> until I do turn it on. But so that would be that low G. Yeah. My, uh, my harp is normally tuned in the key of E flat. Okay. Um, and so um, just for anybody curious about this technical part of it, I'm going to put my harp in C because it's easy for me to do that. And then I'm going to also, by raising these levers, and these levers actually are like little teeny tiny frets like on a guitar, but there's fingers holding them up there. So the harp is now kind of like all the white keys of the piano. That's what it would sound like if you played all the white keys from C up. So now I'm going to raise the Fs. So now I'm in playing in the key of G. So you're, that's what you were doing. And you had this low note. And 
Mm. It, it just helped something totally relax in me. So I played around with that for a while, just with that G and then with my um, right hand, just doing various scales or whatever felt right. Mm. And then I took a little pause and I went into another meditation where I was thinking about her passing and I found myself around the C chord that there was a comforting dissonance. Oh. <laughs> that in that moment, it, it was resonating with like this comforting dissonance that something is changing, but it's okay. And I'm sharing that experience and that I might go today and those chords feel totally different to me. But in that state of mind and consciousness I was in, in that moment, in relationship to trying to access something that was deep in me that I had already put to words, but that words were not enough to help release the energy for me, the harp did it. And I think this is why harp is used in healing music. And I think that, um, and of course, music therapy is a whole branch right. of, of um, healing arts that includes far more than the heart. But of course, we know there is the therapeutic music certification for heart, for heart therapy. Right. It's because it's, it has that capacity to release something. Um, and, and I may have said this, I'm getting ready to co-lead a pilgrimage to Iona. So I've been studying about ancient Celtic spirituality and in Irish Celtic spirituality, the Dagda, who was the good God, played the harp. Uh -huh. And the Dagda, the Irish good gar God, played three airs. He played the air of sleep, which would be the lullaby, um, the air of laughter, um, and the air of grief. Hmm. And um, so I've just really been struck by that. And sometimes now when I sit down at my harp and I look at the tunes I know, I think about what are the airs of grief, the laments, which of course the Scottish and Irish music is wonderful for. And what are the airs of sleep, the lullabies? And then what are the airs of fun or laughter? You know, the jigs, the reels, the dance music. So anyway, I, that might've been a little bit of a tangent, but I think that what we're talking about is if we're looking toward being authentic and whole, then perhaps giving ourselves some space, even with our heart, as well as our day-to-day -day life and relationships, to really find a way to express those deeper resonances in us without having to know the structure ahead of time, because imposing the structure too quickly forecloses the energy. Right. That's right. Impo yeah. Imposing a structure is, that's right. It does it. it right. Uh, there's so much I'm getting from what you just said. And uh, I, uh, one of the things, the really moving things that I just got out of what you said mm -hmm. is that as a human being to be whole, we have to be engaged with others and not just other humans, but other animals and other things and that we can i wouldn't say search for our wholeness but reach for our wholeness in our engagement with these other things yes and and jung there's a quote and i'm not going to be able to remember it exactly but he says wholeness is a combination of I and you. That only in relationship to the other, to you, to the heart, to my little dog, am I going to truly know all the aspects of myself? Wow. Yeah. And so this is one, and, and this also gets to authenticity and wholeness and yeah. how they're related that we need to come, let, let's just let's talk about it. In, I'm just going to look at it in relationship to an instrument because okay. that, there you have it. You come to the instrument with nothing. And what you said, I was talking about just like random monkey, monkey mm -hmm. fingers. But what you said was searching, you know, being open, but searching for a resonance. 
which I'm realizing that resonance sounds like response, where we have a response, a resonance. And you found that in this low string and you had the courage to simply play that low string. And now this, I just want to point out, is something that anyone could do Mm -hmm. with with a harp anyone who's touched a harp or has not touched a harp right. many of us will feel that that is not enough right and yet what i'm hearing is that was where you connected with the authenticity yes. was through that i'm going to i'm also going to point out from a musical standpoint you said the g two below middle C. Mm -hmm. That's a bass note. That's in the bass area of the harp. And the harp gives you, every instrument does this, but um, it's just extremely visual on the, on the harp that you have the three roles of music mm -hmm. outlined. The bass role, the accompaniment role in the middle, and the melodic role up here. And what you said you did is you found one note that you loved, and then you just you let that res resonate in you and in the instrument. Yes. And this is another reason why the harp is such um, a generous instrument for this kind of thing. It does resonate so much. It's simple yeah. and it's obvious and it's clear. And, and then you said, so you did that in the key of G, which means that's a key we're familiar with. It's a mode we're familiar with. And then you said, I shifted. Mm -hmm. And you literally shifted the foundation mm -hmm. with which you were experiencing the rest of what was happening up here. Yes. By shifting the bass note, you're shifting the foundation. And that, you said that that then gave you a sense of dissonance, but embracing that dissonance, mm -hmm. being between two worlds in a sense, and embracing yeah. that and allowing that to happen. Yeah. And now I can come, I'm now deconstructing it. Yeah. You simply experienced it right. and with, with, you know, basic, basic skills and willingness right. and time and engagement with a partner right. who is willingly resonating with you yes yeah and allowing myself to go to the heart and just be present when you said you come to the harp empty it's coming to the heart you know um john cabot where, where you are where you are there where you ever you are there you are or empty yourself and then feel you're there oh, it's like I emptying all of the ego expectations to really be able to be there in my total being and then put my hands on the heart and find what resonates. So, you know, I didn't immediately go to that G, but in going up and down with the scales or whatever pattern I was using, I was aware of when I found it, what I felt inside and what it released. So I think there's a place where, you know, just going with our fingers randomly, but it's bringing a presence and awareness and attunement, you know, and you've talked about how the inner heart, you know, there's the harp in you that when you got that the harp is in you, the difference that made, and that's really what we're talking all around, you know, with these strings is it's yeah, all well, I hear what I'm hearing you say is that you, you came empty, you played, you searched, you listened with your whole body to where you were resonating to the instrument rather than imposing right. onto the instrument. So the instrument became an instrument of self-discovery yes. and self-illumination. And yes. it opened up the instrument on the inside yes. began to resonate. Yeah. Yeah. And the instrument inside it opened up, we might say, was my personality. It allowed me to live more fully all of what was going on inside of me. To live in that moment, to actually be alive to. Yeah. Be alive to it, you know? Yeah. Well, this is something that I'm going to do then, yeah. is to come empty 
um, and be monkey hands to the, and yet monkey hands, but listening. And feeling, feeling in your body. You know, I'm thinking about your example earlier about like the things you would do to numb, to, you know, right. like eating. Right. So if you get an urge or someone who's watching gets an urge to, to go shopping or binge on Netflix or, you know, go to the refrigerator, even though you're not physically hungry, then if you're a musician, go to your instrument, go to the harp and let yourself see, be present to find what is the resonance? What is that? What is it that's the energy that's stirring? Because the harp and the various notes and the various chords evoke and connect with different emotional states. And I, I want to be clear that this is something that a non-musician can do. Oh, absolutely. And, and the harp represents, I mean, the harp, I think, is a, um, is a distillation or a, or a heightened of any sound you know whether it's a rubber band or whether it's um you know the sound of right ourselves and and i think often we don't feel we have the right or i have heard that people like i well i wish i could play a musical instrument mm -hmm. and i would just like to say you can but meaning a cat can look at a king meaning <laughs> you, you don't you don't have to be skilled in order to have that relationship right and you know and i'm thinking and i have my drum over here i kept trying to figure out i have this wonderful drum that's split at the top oh i'll show it to you <laughs> oh okay so it's quote broken it's broken and, and yet but john and i discovered it makes a very different sound there than this side that uh -huh. it is and we've kept it because we thought, you know, it, it really does speak to a different um, feeling state. And that even when something is seemingly broken, it still has its beauty. And so yeah. I, that reminds me of a, a Kaylee I was playing at in, in Scotland once, um, or just a, just a kind of a jam session. And um, I didn't have an instrument or I can't remember what happened, but mm -hmm. at some point I thought, well, I'm going to play whatever I have. If I have a, a harp with one string, I'm going to play that. Mm -hmm. But somehow I didn't have that. And all I had was a lipstick case. <laughs> and, um, and so I started playing the lipstick case and discovering, looking for all the different sounds it could make and the thing, you know, this sliding on, sliding off, the tapping, everything it could do. And then at one point it broke. Mm -hmm. And my immediate thought was like, ah, oh, I broke it. And then, and then I thought, okay, so what does it sound like now? Yeah. Because the breaking of it is only, and this goes back to what you said in the beginning, is only in that part of our mind where we're fitting into what we think it's supposed to be. That's right. And as we engage with it, and this comes to us, and, and I just want to say this to anyone who is, who thinks they are not a musician or not a good enough musician. That is that moment where we're shutting ourselves out. And, yes. and, I, and anyone can do this, what you said, and it is just as difficult and just as easy for anyone to go to an instrument or a pencil or a desk or whatever and make sound Yes. or feel with it. If you're deaf, and then, then you would go for feel. It doesn't matter what it is. That's right. and, and then to find where you are resonating, where you are the instrument, mm -hmm. and to then engage with it there. And I think for me, that's the answer to the question that we, it's an answer of yeah. how I can and anyone can go to those things you were talking about authenticity and wholeness and how they actually and you know um affect each other and 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 make this bloom yeah yeah i think that's a beautiful summary <laughs> thank you i'm kathleen i i just love that we you know came to the end mm -hmm. of what we'd conceived of as this series and then we said, let's go on. Yeah. And not knowing what that going on would be. And for me, 
I, I feel like, wow, now we're just at a, a new opening. Yes, yeah, it feels that way to me too. So thank you so much. Is there anything that you wanna add at the, is there anything you wanna say? I just wanna to say to everybody who's watching and to me included, to be courageous enough several times a day to come to be present with yourself by being empty of all of who you think you are and what you're supposed to be doing. And just give room, whether it's through writing, through putting your hands on an instrument, or through being with your breath or moving around your house, however, to, to find what's resonating deep in you in that moment. Yeah, it's an act I of love person. that. I love that. And I and I will I will my you know fairy wishes <laughs> um is is to have the daring for myself, you know, for anybody who's listening, to have the daring to um to touch and engage with something that I think I have no right. Mm, yeah. And see and and meet it, you know. Um, yeah, meet it. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much, Kathleen. Yeah. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Yes, I'll see you next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay.